Thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right, uh, let's begin. So welcome to the FNS session. Um, the topic is the Catch Me If You GPT. So we're gonna give the high level tutorial on the uh, defect tags. Right. So my name is Dongwon Lee. I'm a professor at Penn State and I'm presenting this tutorial with the two of my uh, collaborators, uh, Dr. Ara Gu Chendu uh, at the MIT Lincoln Lab and then Professor Tai Le at the University of Mississippi. So bulk of these uh, materials to be presented is based on this survey that we presented uh, this year. Okay, so we structured our tutorial uh, as follows. So I'm gonna start with the introduction and uh, gentle review on the language model. And then we will have a, a, the hands-on game, like a 10 minutes to test how easy or difficult um, it is for you to discern whether something is a defect or not. And then the next, the Dr. Uchendo will uh, cover the detection side of it. And then we will have a break. And then Dr. Le will cover the obfuscation. And then I will conclude the uh, finally, okay? And uh, if you find the, our uh, tutorial uh, useful, then feel free to download, either use, use, using this QR code or you can just type in this uh, URL, okay? I'll just give you maybe 10 seconds uh, for you to scan. So this link will uh, bring you to the website and at the top, there's the link to the PDF of the our uh, slide. Okay, and throughout I will uh, come back and then show the uh, QR code uh, again and again. So, all right. So let's start with the uh, rough definition. Uh, looking at the other presentation in this event, I feel we are a bit of the out of place because this has nothing to do with the infrastructure. But nevertheless, since this is one of the emerging uh, hot issues in security community, I hope that uh, this will be useful to some of the audience. So DFAKES, as everyone knows, is an acronym combining the deep learning and fakes. So it's really referring to any type of artifact that are made by advanced AI, especially deep learning, uh, that you know really uh, the 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 the, uh, the the across the different uh, modality. So although our focus on the text modality, it comes with the audio type, image type, video type, or any combination of them. Okay? So within computer science, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of advancement in this topic, but it's really the two sub disciplines are, are driving the advancement the text domain uh, by NLP community, and then uh, media uh, domain by computer vision or computer graphics uh, sub-discipline. Okay, so let me just distinguish the deep fakes from the shallow fakes. Um, the outcome might be similar. So if you remember this episode of the Nancy Fellow uh, slow video or, or where she appears to be uh, the speaking drunken, it turns out that the that video was made by just simple technique. Somebody just uh, slow down the audio part uh, and then making her appear to be uh, drunken. While well, the consequence was uh, still detrimental, the technique itself is very naive, right? So our interests are not such uh, the uh, artifact, which is often called the shallow fakes or cheap fakes. Our interest is more on the defects uh, that involve the AI techniques. Right. So let's start with the, a few uh, examples of the uh, multimedia type and then uh, go to the text uh, type. So this beautiful image is uh, depicting the future uh, opera scene, right? Uh, and you know, the, it, it's a very nice picture. And it became the, the topic of the uh, discussion last year because somebody generated this image using the, one of the uh, generative AI technique, submitted to the art festival in the Colorado, and surprisingly, this won the first place. Right? Uh, and then to the author's uh, defense, he didn't uh, hide anything. He declared at the submission time that this was made by Midi Journey and then upscaled by one of the Google tools. And then in the, the resolution was increased and so on. Right? But still, the judges found out that the, this uh, AI made uh, image was better than other uh, human generated images and award the uh, first place, okay? So this sort of the, you know, indicates the, how good the uh, 
generative AI techniques uh, producing the high quality or artistic uh, image uh, types. Okay. Here I prepared the 12 human faces and I number them. So this is a mixture. Uh, two are real human faces, okay? And then 10 are AI generated faces. Okay. Can you guess which images are two real human faces here? Just using whatever rationale that you have, you can shout out the number. One and eight, five and two, three and seven. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> pretty much every number. So yeah. these two are the real humans, right? Six and 12, they are my graduate students. So they are real humans. Remaining tens are so-called uh, gen-generated images. So they are faces of the non-existing people. In fact, if you go to this website, the page after page, using one of the latest scan images, they show stunning human faces, right? And you know, the, we can see that the uh, beneficial application of this tool, right? Uh, if you, for instance, need to use the human face, the IP free, then you can generate one and then maybe post to uh, the newspaper, right? But also we can see the obvious negative downside uh, when, when somebody used this for malicious purpose, okay? Effective immediately, I request president of Penn State University to double Professor Dong Wen Lee's annual salary. So you can guess whose voice I'm mimicking here. Okay. Effective immediately, I re So since I'm cheap, I didn't purchase the uh, commercial version, which is like a $40, $50. Here I used the free version. So you can see the kind of quirkiness here and there. But if you're willing to pay, and uh, purchase the commercial one, then you can access really good uh, smooth audio model. And then besides, you know, a lot of the celebrities and the politicians models are already pre-built, right? So you can just pay, click, and generate, right? And here's the really scary uh, technique. In this work, we present the first text-based video editing approach that lets editors insert new text in addition to cutting, copying, and pasting the existing transcript text. Our approach allows editing at any point and synthesizes the corresponding correct lip-synced video. Okay. The market closed today with Apple's stock price at $191.45 per share. Here we replace 91.4 with 82.2. Okay. The market closed today with Apple's stock price at $182.25 per share. Sorry for the glitch. So really what happened here is, based on the command line uh, the, uh, instruction, on the spot, they generate the, uh, the mimicking the audio model, and also they create the matching mouse movement, and she moves back to the original video, right? So with this technique, virtually now we can make someone say something they never say. And this technology is already available three, four years ago. And the, the research team behind this technology spun off. And then they now have this startup where they claim that now you can edit video just like you can edit Microsoft Word. Of course, as a research prototype, there is a limitation. For instance, to attack this person, you need to have access to several hours of the video, right? But again, if you are celebrities or, or politicians, you go to the YouTube, then it's fairly easy to get that much uh, video. Right? So this kind of technique used to be only available to the expert, right? The uh, technically uh, savvy users. But now if I Google it, or if I go to the M market, they really became the off-the-shelf commodity technology. I, I see apps and then you know software that I can download. And just with a few clicks, I can generate very high quality defect artifacts. So because of this, people got really scared and then they start report uh, you know, the episode. So here I have a few examples where people reported the actual defect based attacks for politicians, 
NGO activists, a lot of the revenge porn cases, unfortunately, right? And this is uh, only the years ago, so it's getting worse and worse in exponential speed. Okay. So finally, the, the modality that we are interested in, uh, text domain, um, the, right now the a tool to generate text is pretty much dominated by this uh, model called the large scale language model, LIMM. And you know, very simply speaking, uh, if I abstract uh, you know, the very uh, roughly, then language model is a way to calculate the probability distribution over a word sequence. Right? So you know, if you ask what is the likelihood for the phrase such as what a wonderful word, then this is very common phrase, the probability will be uh, a bit high. But if you ask what a wonderful pig, because it's very rare combination, the probability will be much lower, right? And a uh, decade ago, uh, based on the corpus data, we used to count uh, the, this occurrence, right? Among the entire corpus, how many times this particular phrase appear? And then based on that, we try to estimate the probabilities. But these days, everything has changed. So now no longer we can't. We use a neural network to predict likelihood of, of the, this uh, word sequence. Okay? And, and you know, the, the, the performance has become so much better. Okay? But even then, we had uh, some of uh, the, uh, the building, the, 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 the issues, such as when we start to learn very long sequence, we tend to forget what we saw very earlier. right? Or, or because of the architectural limitation, we have to, uh, you know, the rely on the uh, huge uh, hardware, and we cannot really uh, learn in a parallel fashion, right? So then limit our scale of the learning. But around the 2017, 18, this whole thing uh, changed. Right? So we had a two-phase architecture of the transformer from the Google, uh, and then subsequently we have a, a a lot of foundation model, especially the two well-known ones, built from the Google and then GPT from OpenAI. Okay? And this really introduced the uh, window of opportunity and people realized that with this foundation model, if you just uh, take the existing pre-trained model and then just tweak a little bit toward your uh, particular domain, then you can have a good access to the good performance that's much better than the state of the art of performance. And, and people got really excited. They downloaded this foundation model and they start to you know, modify. So if I go to the uh, repository called the hugging phase, uh, there are multiple uh, categories. And then one category is called the text generation. Right? So when we check uh, just uh, the today, right now we have almost 30,000 uh, language models deposited. Okay? Of course, not all these language models are a unique uh, different architecture. A lot of them are just a minor uh, variation of the uh, open source one. But nevertheless, each of these one is capable of generating very good, high quality, long coherent text without much problem. If we zoom in a few of those, maybe it's a really a uh, very large scale uh, language model uh, because of the you know, constraint for the resource and, and money, uh, only big organizations are uh, afforded, right? And here we plot them using the uh, time on the x-axis and then a, a parameter as the y-axis. Okay? And this is a log plot. So this red line indicating the growth of the language models is actually showing the exponential growth. Okay? So we already have uh, several models above the trillion uh, parameter size, and then several above the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, billion size, and then several above the uh, trillion size. And you know the parameter uh, is essentially when you have a neural network, you you know multiply the number of the nodes at the uh, uh, input, and the number of the nodes at the output, and then some some addition of the uh, bias, and that is the size of the uh, parameters, right? So when you talk about the br a billion size or trillion size parameters, it's just unimaginably large size, right? But even then, uh, sort of the, this was only the uh, you know, issues that the AI researchers were excited about, the lay persons, you know, didn't really care until we had this chat GPT came out the uh, end of last year. And for some reason, this just picked up, right? And suddenly a whole society 
entire uh, you know uh, world is so so much excited about this ChatGPT, and we have seen the, a lot of uh, interesting res results afterwards. Right. So here is the article. Uh, if you just uh, read a few lines, you will not see obvious grammatical errors, and things you know seem to flow okay, right? So this essay with the title "Robots Come in Peace" is kind of the argue that robot is not harming us, right? And this is the UK uh, newspaper Guardian's experiment done in 2020. And at the bottom of the article, they revealed that entire essay was written by GPT-3, and that made people, you know, quite excited or scared. And then fast forward, even the this year now. The Guardian uh, uh, saying that now the ChatGPT is making the fake Guardian articles, so they have to you know come up with some kind of a policy to respond it, right? So it's a bit ironical. Now fast forward, where are we right now? We are talking about the GPT four that is believed to be uh, smartest of the all language models, and this graph is from the their technical report. So here blue indicate the accuracy performance of the GPT 3.5. That is the basis of the older uh, chat GPT. And then green is the performance of the latest GPT 4. Right? And X axis shows the some of the uh, tasks that even are challenging for the humans. Right? So for instance, here is the English test. Many graduate students, when they go to graduate school, they have to take the GRE test and uh, you know GPT 4. Is showing you know eighty to even the close to hundred percent for GRE verbal, so very impressive uh, the result, and the low related the uh, bar exams, GPT four is already beyond uh, the passing level of the uh, bar test. So if the the question is limited to the multiple choice, GPT four can be definitely become a lawyer at this point. Some people went really extreme. Uh, so some of the researchers even claim that ChatGPT is their co-author, right? Uh, personally, I wouldn't go this far, but this this shows the quite extreme usage of the ChatGPT. So, you know, this of course uh, has a mixed reaction. Some community uh, you know openly welcome, while a lot of other community initial reaction was the you know, uh, negative. So they banned the usage. Uh, for instance, the top uh, AI conference called ICML, they uh, specifically banned the usage of the uh, language model based article writing uh, for this conference. And a lot of the other ACM conference follow. But is it really that scary? Is a chat GPT or the language model uh, generate text uh, are problem free? Not really. AI researchers are reporting lots of issues. So one of the issue is called the memorization because they learn from the existing corpus. They tend to spit out exact replica of the, what they've seen. And if some of these uh, replica contains uh, the personally identifiable information, that, that becomes a privacy concern. And the people reported this uh, episode already. And then you know, further expanding this, uh, this year my group reported that not only language model uh, produce the replica, they tend to uh, plagiarize in a more cunning way. Right? So the second row showing that the what we call the paraphrase of plagiarism, meaning that two sentences are essentially uh, very similar, but the language model swap the order or they use the synonym. So it appears to be slightly different, but if you look deep down, then essentially plagiarism. And then third type for the ideal plagiarism is most cunning and the most scary one. Again, this is the essentially same idea, but language model tended to elongate or compress it, so that it appears to be different. But then again, uh, this is a problematic, right? So normal essay writing, maybe this is okay, but you know, in a, in an application such as the uh, the uh, legal, uh, you know, law related one or scientific writing. Uh, this kind of a plagiarism is also not allowed. So we need to teach language model uh, somehow not to do this kind of behavior. Another well-known limitation of the language model is a bias. 
Well, in a sense, this is unfair criticism to language model because we gave them a bi the bias, the, the, the learning materials, and we asked them to mimic us. So of course, they will uh, capture the bias. Right? Uh, so here, the, what, what it's showing is that depending on the occupation, language men, uh, model tend to show different sentiment. So if the occupation is a baker versus an accountant, then bakers, uh, the, the baker related tags tend to be more uh, you know, positive and accountant related uh, tags would be uh, more uh, negative. Okay? Similarly, uh, my colleagues at Penn State uh, published this paper this year, finding out that the language model is also biased toward the uh, nationality, right? So if you start with a certain uh, the demonym uh, based prompt, such as American people are, and then ask the language model to uh, fill, fill up the rest, then we tend to have a more positive content, whereas the other countries, such as the Mexican or African people, is a lot opposite, right? So again, uh, you know, the, we gave the wrong data and asked them to learn, so this is what we get, but nevertheless, we have to address this issue. We cannot, uh, you know, give the data tool uh, to the general uh, users to use it. Another well-known issue is called the toxicity. Uh, language model tended to say really mean things. Um, so this research is the, from the uh, the EMNLP 2019 uh, paper. So what the authors have found is that no matter the uh, the content of the uh, actual text they sort of found the universal trigger is anything they uh, prepare in the beginning can detect what they will say at the end, okay? So, so using some of the gradient-based the, uh, the optimization technique, given any prompt, they can find out this universal trigger. And if you can uh, uh, prepare this to the uh, prompt, then what you get at the end is a really toxic generation. Similarly, uh, in this research, what they reported is if you assign different persona to the language model, they also behave quite differently, right? So if you tell language model, they imagine that you are a good person and then ask them to generate, or you know, we ask them to imagine that you are a bad person such as this and that, then they are uh, they behaving quite opposite, right? So here the example of the good person versus the bad person or Hitler versus the uh, Kennedy, you see the uh, difference in terms of the toxicity in the generated text. Right? So this is all concerning uh, result. Uh, and you know, the language model, despite all the excitement, it has a lot of issues. And finally, the what I'm most concerned is called the uh, hallucination. So this is a phenomenon that language model, when they were asked, they generated text with the full of confidence, but the, what they generate is just the BS, right? It's not factually grounded. Uh, and, and you know the uh, incorrect information. So here in this example, uh, the authors asked the ChatGPT to generate the description about the certain AI researchers, and they later show this result to that researcher uh, himself and ask him to verify what is true and what is not. And all this yellow part is completely BS, okay? according to the uh, the person himself. And also when the ChatGPT just came out last year, somebody uh, did this jailbreaking. So this person asked ChatGPT to uh, create the argument uh, for why vaccine causes uh, autism, which is uh, fake news. But surprisingly, ChatGPT went on and uh, generated a very convincing argument. Okay? So this is clearly a problem. Uh, to to the, the defense of the ChatGPT, once this episode was reported, they quickly patched it. But now no longer is it that easy to generate this kind of fake news using the uh, language model. However, still researchers are reporting all kinds of different, very uh, you know, cunning uh, jailbreaking by by trick tweaking the language model. Still, they are able to uh, language model to behave badly. So, if you combine all this, what can they do? For instance, I claim this as a fake news 2.0. Uh, so, if I want to spread the rumor saying that, you know, the fraud happens to a certain city, maybe, uh, you know, be, uh, unlike the uh, Macedonian Mar kid who manually write the fake news uh, for the 2016 US election, now I just come up with a very clickbaity title. I feed into one of the language model to generate the 
accompanying uh, argument. I use one of the uh, Gen AI techniques to create the evidence type uh, images, put into the nice formatting, and then I will circulate. Right? Then I guarantee that this will be uh, audible magnitude more effective than traditional 1929 uh, fake news. Okay? And the beauty of this, from the adversary's point of view, I spend nothing here, no resource, no dollar. Okay? So the scalability is another uh, the benefit for the adversary. I don't need to stop here, and I can easily repeat it for multiple countries, multiple regions, and so on. Okay. And this has been only speculation just a few months ago, but now we're already seeing a report saying that uh, adversaries are using the language model to create the fake news in some kind of a, a fake news or fun website. Right? So this is mainly a profit-oriented one, but they already uh, using the language model to generate the articles and then have uh, tons of the articles there. And it shows the uh, evidence that this is written by a language model. Right? There are a large of them. So what can we do right? so from the security community? There are multiple uh, intellectually interesting research issues. So here we focus on the two such issues. First one is called the detection. Right? You are given text, right? Uh, and then um, you know, for, for security or privacy concerns, somehow you need to know whether this is legitimate human written uh, text or this could be possibly written by one of the AI machines. Right? So this is sort of the attribution problem. Right? Uh, the detection problem. Or if I even generalize more, right? Uh, given the text, who could be a possible author, right? It could be one of the K authors or one of the uh, K uh, language models, right? So out of those the you know multiple authors, who could be possibly the single author who wrote this article? So this is like a multi-class classification problem, what they call authorship attribution problem. The opposite side is also important. Uh, for some application, you have a text written and you want to hide who wrote this one. Maybe you need to understand this problem better so that you can prepare better for the attack. Or maybe some from you know, a military application, this uh, obfuscation might actually come in handy. Right? But this is sort of the dual problem uh, from the detection and obfuscation. If we have a better obfuscation, then detection becomes weaker. If we have a better detection, then obfusc obfuscation becomes weaker. So both problems is the dual uh, uh, the study problem. Okay, let me quickly stop here. Any questions so far? Okay, so before we go to the actual topic, we prepared uh, sort of the hands-on game. Here we prepared five or six uh, quiz uh, using the Kahoot. So if you have uh, your smartphone, Right. So you go to the kahoot.it or use the, this QR code, type in the game pin, and then just the, enter your nickname because uh, you know, your score will be shown here. Uh, 
right? So I'm gonna start. Okay, so there was a defect image. So I don't know how you figured out, but a lot of you got it right. So Genius Gator is the winner so far. So I think it, the, the game works is if you get the uh, correct question faster, you get the higher point. Okay? But if you get it wrong, then you lose a lot of points. So just, uh, Second question. There was a real human. There's another graduate student in my lab. So I think somehow you guys are doing very well. In, in other study that we did, the human performance for the binary uh, question like this was merely 53% accurate, right? So as compared to that group, I think you guys are doing much better somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this time text. So we gave a prompt, and then here's the uh, text. Is this a real one or is it an article from the newspaper? So there was a force. That's the real uh, news article. Okay. Who's a bright rooster? Okay. <laughs> So there was indeed generated by GPT-2. Okay, we need to change it. Only two more questions. <clears throat> okay. 
this time we show two parallels and ask whether only one is defaced or both are defaced. So both were defaced. So the answer was a false. Okay. Last one. Again, the right answer was a false. Both were defects. All right, with the hamster. <laughs> Congratulations. <All right. laughs> um, so I guess the point is that the, even now, using the not the latest version, but a few years old version of the GPT-2, it's not necessarily easy to discern the authorship of the uh, uh, defect text, right? And also same for the images and even video as well. So I'm gonna switch the gear and then my colleague will present about the, so then how can we address this issue? How can we detect the defect text first, okay? Thank you. So now, now I'm going to present the detection side. Um, yeah. So there are two, for this generation, um, the generation of large language models, there are two techniques to uh, uh, address this detection side. There's the pre-hoc and then there's the post-hoc. So pre-hoc was a, a more recent uh, thing where people are now, um, interested in, okay, so since it's, it might be getting harder to detect or distinguish the authorship of these, uh, whether it's like human or LLM generated or deep fake, what about if we make this easier for everyone by just watermarking the, the text such that it has like artifacts that, you know, they are imperceptible to us, but it's, it's algorithmically like identifiable by machine learning model. And there's also the uh, metadata based technique, but this is typically for um, the images where you have like external like um, data that comes with creation of images and then you can use that to detect if an image is like fake or not. And then there's the post hoc uh, approach, which is the Mo which is what I will focus on in this uh, presentation. But for post hoc, there's a supervised and unsupervised, and those are the automatic types of detection. And then there's human-based approaches because 
you know, at the end of the day, we want uh, the goal is to um, empower humans to be able to do this task by themselves in the future. So this is a, a, an example of this uh, meta-based technique. So you have your image and then you have all this information on the side and you can use that in the detection process. So this uh, watermarking technique is, uh, I, I can give you an example, like on the right-hand side, you have your prompt and then you, you have your generation. So in the middle of the frame is the generation without watermarking. And then the other is the generation with watermarking. So how this works is that you, you have um, uh, using some technique you create uh, green listed words and red listed words, and you make it so that your uh, model samples from only the green listed words and has less um, red, red listed words, such that it's easy for you to distinguish it from humans because humans would have more red, red listed words. And, um, since this this what since the watermark paper came out in January, uh, people have been thinking about oh how can we make this technique even better and how robust is this to like all the obfuscation techniques which uh, my colleague Ty will talk more about. So what these people did was uh, they looked at like different um, uh, paraphrasing techniques. So you have taken out the red listed words, but when you paraphrase, you add some more red listed words. And there's machine paraphrasing, there's human paraphrasing, and then there's text mixing. So you just mix a bunch of documents together. And they found out that even though you paraphrase, you can, you can still like distinguish them because you, you just need more tokens. So for example, for when there's human paraphrasing, which is the strongest um, paraphrasing technique, you need up to 800 tokens, so 800 words to distinguish, which is pretty large, actually. So now uh, the landscape of deepfake text is such that, you know, we have humans. Humans are the uh, gold standard. We are trying, the uh, LLMs are trying to emulate the humans such that they, are, they have the same quality. But you know, some researchers say that at some point, uh, based on the rate that we are going, LLM quality would be uh, much better than humans. And we can discuss this after, if you believe it or not. But we don't know when that will happen. Some people say uh, in a decade, some people say in a few years. But either way, um, whatever we learn from the post hoc approaches will help us during that time and also we find that these uh, approaches actually work quite well. So I'm looking at the um, authorship attribution of defect text. So that's looking at uh, g giving the authorship to who, who wrote this text, whether it was human or whether it was a uh, uh, machine. And for the authorship attribution tags, they can be uh, K number of authors. So human versus several other LLMs like ChatGPT, Falcon, Flan T5, there's so many of them now. But uh, the more well-studied version is the binary situation where you're looking at just human versus uh, LLM. And that's, we call that the Turing test problem. However, for this talk, I will not distinguish between the multi-class or the binary class setting. I'll just call them all defect text detectors. So um, people have been studying this stuff since 2019 because GPT-1 came out in 2018. And since then, uh, researchers have proposed methods in different categories. Uh, one is a stylometric based uh, technique where you're looking at uh, capturing the writing style of an author using like linguistic profiling. And deep learning based, which is mostly um, using BERT variant, so BERT. And then statistical based technique where you're trying to ascertain the, auth the, the writing style of an author using the uh, probability distribution of the way they write. So like, uh, what's the probability distribution of the piece of text that this author has written? And then this hybrid based technique, which is 
an ensemble of two or more of these techniques. And lastly, there's the human-based approaches. So there are four automatic uh, techniques and there are two um, human-based uh, approaches. And yeah, I've already discussed the style. Yeah. What, what? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a that's a good question. These um, these models are trained on the data. So if there's a lot of like Harry Potter style coming from ChatGPT, it should work. But you know, you can only know it when you test it. And that's also another thing is that some of them are very good at distinguishing it. Some of them are not very good, and also. Now we have ChatGPT. We can now do that, which we weren't able to do before. So that's uh, one thing, and that also is more in the obfuscation side, where you are trying to change the writing style of, like, maybe the large language model, which um, Ty would talk more about. Actually, does that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? Okay. So one, uh, uh, this is a stylometric base technique that we actually uh, proposed. And this is using um, um, LIWC, which is a psycholinguistic feature dictionary. And getting the readability score of an author and getting the entropy. So entropy meaning the information in the text. And then just putting it into a classical machine learning model like Random Forest. So the linguistic uh, inquiry and word count um, um, feature has three uh, three types of features. So standard linguistic dimensions, psycho psychological processes, and spoken categories. But these all come up to be like ninety three features. An example is like for the friend feature, it just counts the number of words that are synonyms of friends. And then readability score is you get um, a score between zero and 100 and each of this region. So zero to 30 means that the writing is very difficult and thus the um, author is of post-college grade level. And then we also uh, calculate entropy. Now, there are different ways to calculate entropy and some of them can become like intractable. So we just distill down to a simple version of just calculating the number of unique characters. So the insights we, get, we got from this uh, linguistic model is that uh, human and deep fake text have about the same amount of information. There was no uh, this differences between the entropies. And for some of the um, language models that we looked at. So we had human, and then we had like uh, Grover, uh, PPLM, GPT-2. Those were the high, higher performing uh, models, which means that their writing style was more similar to human and thus were harder to detect. And we also find that uh, uh, intuitively humans had the highest uh, educational level. Then there's also another stylometric technique, uh, the feature-based uh, detector, where they proposed different feature space, spaces based on their hypothesis on how uh, machines generate text. So one is that they, they, pro they propose uh, some features to calculate synthetic, uh, sy syntactic and lexical diversity because they believe that uh, machines will not have as much diversity as humans will. And they also believe that uh, the machines would have more repetitive words, they will lack coherence, and they will lack purpose. So they use uh, different, for the syntactic and lexical diversity, they use named entity tags. So seeing how many um, uh, named entities are aware in the piece of text, counting the usage of different parts of speech. Um, for repetitiveness, they looked at the number of of you know, function words, uh, the number of unique words, uh, lack of coherence. They looked at 
um, how many times was an entity referenced. So if I'm talking about, um, like, like for instance, we are talking about deepfake text. How many times was deepfake text referenced in the piece of text? And lack of purpose. So they looked at like something uh, very similar to the LIWC feature. And here are the results. So they, they find that um, using the ensemble of all these features, they are able to, um, by some degree, distinguish between uh, the human written text and the language models. Now I'm going to go to the second one, the deep learning, deep learning based uh, detector. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So um, I'm going to assume that everybody knows BERT. Um, maybe that's not a fair assumption, but... Um, but yeah, there are different transformer-based techniques, BERT, Roberta, these are all variants of BERT, and this is the um, more uh, famous technique for building defect text detector, where people just generate their data and they fine-tune on, on BERT. So this is just how it works. And this actually um, is exactly what uh, Dr. Ishmael was talking about when he did his uh, tutorial. So you just pass your text through the neural network and then you classify it. And um, this GPT-2 output detector by Hugging Face uses such model, uses Roberta. So fine-tuned on GPT-2 and human written text, I was able to di distinguish them. Okay. Uh, so in, in below you see the, the bar. Um, so I have the piece of text and it says that it's, it tells me with a 99% confidence that it's fake, which it isn't actually because I wrote that. So sometimes these models um, don't perform very well. I should also say that this is like for GBT2 and GBT2 was the state of the art in 2019, not anymore. And then we have also Grover detector, which was which is very similar to the method that GPT-2 detector used. I also gave it the same piece of text and it also said it was, I it also called me a machine as well. So like I said, not very good sometimes. And they showed results, they, they uh, so this, uh, the people who wrote Grover, they had a generator and they built a detector as well. And they find that their detector, detection model is able to, uh, detect its own generated text more, um, much better than other models, which is pretty intuitive actually. But uh, we also ran um, this study for like several, we had like 19 language models, but these were uh, variants of 10 unique uh, architectures. And we find that these models are not actually very good at this task. So if you see below where we have the average, you can see that uh, three Grover detector, GBT2 detector, and the GLTR is pronounced glitter. And I'll ex tell you more about that one later. But you can see that they perform at about like with highest 60% uh, F1 score. However, when we fine tune Bert and Roberta, uh, it performed uh, much better on this task. So now we look at the statistical based detectors. So uh, statistical based detectors are interested in uh, calculating the probability distribution of text and then using that as a feature to distinguish the authorship. This is one, uh, one of the uh, techniques. This was the first uh, statistical based techniques and the first, uh, probably the only first interpretable um, defect text detector. And what they do here is they have like, you put in your, you can go to their website to, to do this demo. You put in your piece of text and then it highlights it. And what the color scheme is, is uh, the green words are the most probable words. So um, if you think about machine text generators are not as not being very good, it means that they will have a lot more green words than humans. And then yellow is the second most probable Red is the least probable, and then uh, purple is the highest improbable. And so in the 
um, machine generated text, there should be little to no purple text. And this was true uh, when, again, GPT-2 was the state of the art, but now um, ChatGPT's text is pretty good. It looks very human based on this task. Um, Another one uh, which is uh, pretty famous right now is the Detect GPT. And this one incorporates the obfuscation technique. So what they do is you have a piece of text and then you generate uh, different versions of that text using a paraphrasing tool, and, which is another large language model that they do use. And then they calculate the uh, probability um, scores of this text and then they compare it. So they find that um, deep fake text tends to lie in the negative curvature of the log probability, while human written text tends to lie in the, uh, in the more positive um, log probability curvature. And then they have different uh, statistics-based detector uh, baseline models now the log likelihood, which is just calculating the, you know, the log probability, the rank, which is calculating the average rank of the words based on the English dictionary, and then the log rank, then the entropy, which is calculating the information, and um, one of the glitter-based techniques. And so we find that Detect GPT actually outperforms uh, all these models by quite a margin, actually. So now we have another statistical-based technique, uh, which we call GPT-WHO. And what it does is that it, it looks at this from an information theoretical um, perspective, where you're look, calculating the uniform, uniform information density. And you calculate, uh, you get this uniform information density features uh, from the text after getting the probability. They concatenate them, put them into a classifier. And then we see that actually the model is able to generalize better than other baseline models on uh, out of distribution data sets. Then we have the hybrid based uh, detector. So this one uses a, um, a technique where it's, it's an ensemble of transformer based techniques and uh, graphical representation. So it takes the graphical representation of the text, calculates um, the coherence scores, takes the ensemble of that, and then puts it in the last layer, the softmax layer. And we find that the this fast model actually is able to perform uh, better than Roberta, which is the base model that it uses. Then there's another uh, clever technique, which uh, I do like this one, is the TDA-based uh, detector, where it calculates topological features. But what it does first is that it gets the birth weights or the birth embeddings of the text. Then it builds, uh, they build a directed and undirected graph with the attention weights. They, calc they get the to different topological features, um, use an ensemble of that with logistic regression, and they show that it's actually able to perform on par with BERT, which is pretty impressive because they did not fine tune the birds. They use uh, <coughs> pre-trained weights. And then another uh, technique is uh, combining uh, Roberta and uh, stylometric classifiers, <coughs> which is not um, um, the more famous uh, ensemble techniques that people do. People mostly combine transformer-based and statistical-based techniques because Transformer-based techniques have are uh, able to perform the best, um, but statistical-based techniques are also are able to perform uh, the best when um, when the text is obfuscated. So they are more adversarially robust than transformer-based techniques. But these people uh, did an interesting thing where they uh, combined uh, Roberta and stylometric features. So they just got some stylometric features and they got the Roberta weights and they concatenated them. I used that for their classifier. And they, for the stylometric uh, uh, features, they got some uh, features to, to, to detect the change point of the authorship. 
which um, is specific to the tasks that they were solving. So for the previous models, they just look at, is this text generated by human or not? But for this, they have uh, a Twitter, th Twitter thread and the uh, motivation is that sometimes someone can generate um, a tweet and add it to a thread <coughs> and pretend to be the <coughs> author of the previous threads. And so with this, with their model, they're able to detect when the authorship has changed from a Twitter thread. And you can see that uh, their model, which is below, was, is, ab is able to outperform other baseline models by, by a large margin, margin actually. So finally, <clears throat> for the automatic detectors, we find that the hybrid based um, detectors and the deep learning based detectors perform about the same. And the statistical based and stylometric based are perform worse than them. So finally, the human based approaches. Uh, this was a, a famous, it was a pretty popular paper in 2021, All That Human Is Not Good, so evaluating human evaluation of generated text. So they looked at three domains, story, news, recipe, and they looked at two language models, GPT-2, Excel, and GPT-3. And then they asked the question, um, who, who do you think the source of this text is? And they have four options, definitely human written, possibly human written, possibly machine generated, definitely machine generated. Now, if you pick definitely human written, it would ask you, why did you choose this rationale? Now, if you picked anything else, it would ask you, uh, what would you like to change to make them seem more human-like? And they use different uh, training techniques to see if they can improve the baseline performance. So instruction-based, example-based, and comparison-based. So this is an example of what the instruction-based uh, looks like. It's just giving you hints as to um, you know, pitfalls. So repetition and factuality is something you can pay attention to um, because machine generated texts can have a lot more, a lot of repetition and they are also not factually grounded. On the other hand, people focus on grammar and spelling, but humans are just as likely to have like grammar, grammar issues as the machine generated text. And then for style, like he asked, like, you know, the, these models are trained on a large amount of data, so they can actually mimic uh, different styles very well. Then there's uh, the example-based technique where you just give it a piece of text and then have give people a piece of text and then you ask them to just um, um, with unlimited tries to see if they can detect um, the text as true. And this is before they are given the task of detection. And then there's the comparison base where you give them both a human and machine and pretty much train them on the task. So they, uh, they find that actually the example-based technique performs the best uh, with, with an average of 55% uh, percent accuracy. However, um, if you actually look at the results, it's still like the the baseline performance is 50%. So it only increased by 5% margin, which is not great given that it's 50%. So the takeaway here is that both untrained and trained humans perform poorly. And while example-based training is the best, we need better evaluation techniques because even though we have models that are able to achieve like 90% accuracy or F1 score, uh, humans are still not able to do this task and these are the people who we build these models for. So there's a, um, a paper that we did, a Turing Bench, and we asked humans to do two tasks. So the first task was uh, given a piece of text, can you detect if something is, if it's machine or not? And, and then we asked them for study two, uh, given two texts, one is human, one is machine, which one is machine. What we find here is that actually um, humans are also only able to achieve about 50% uh, uh, accuracy, which is just chance level. But what the humans actually didn't know for study one is that we 
only gave them uh, machine generated text and asked them if it was machine or not and they were able to only achieve a 50 53 uh, percent like accuracy so lastly we have uh is gpt3 text indistinguishable um from human text so this this task uh was a little different where they tried to annotate the error types in in um the machine generated text and what they did was they crowdsourced it they first defined uh three types of error so reader factual and language error and uh the um language errors are just it lacks <clears throat> coherency and consistency factual errors are you know the, it's just inconsistent with the prompt and reader issues is just the text is too obscure or filled with too much jargon and so these are uh, more of the different um, errors within the error categories so they looked at different four language models, GPT-2 small, GPT-2 XL, Grover, and GPT-3. And they, before they asked the humans to annotate, they gave them uh, a, a task to, train, to test them. And if they achieved over a 90, per, 90 points, then they, then they asked them to annotate. But then if they did not, they did not ask them to annotate. So this is what the interface looks like. And they did different um, um, classifications using the different arrows. And so, so the arrows uh, below shows like, so this, uh, the arrow this way means decreasing. Um, the L means the model, so the model's plateaued. And the upward arrow is the rising and falling. And then H is human. So this means that the higher the the errors are highest there. So we find that for for encyclopedia that the errors are um, lower as the language model becomes um, larger. So GPT two small is like one hundred and twenty four million parameter, and GPT three is uh, one point seven billion parameters. So um, when you see in, the same thing for incoherent and the same thing for, for common sense, but then for like technical jargon, you can see that the, er the errors are highest for human. So finally, we have like does human collaboration enhance the accuracy of identifying LLM generated defect text? So we decided um, to incorporate collaboration into this detection task. So we see that humans perform pretty poorly on this task. And we wanted to see if we can improve performance by um, asking humans to collaborate both synchronously or non-synchronously. So synchronously means that they are able to see each other and talk to each other. And non-synchronously means that I get the um, answers from one human, I give it to the other human without them talking to each other. And uh, for the non so we looked at two audiences, so non-experts, uh, non-experts being people who do not have like a, a degree in English literature or any related um, uh, degree such as that. And then experts being people who have such degrees. So in order to level the playing field a bit, we, did, we decided to use the example-based technique that I showed you previously, which um, increase, improved the performance a bit. And we find that, um, collaboration does actually improve the performance. Uh, we use Amazon Mechanical Turk for non-experts. So we're only able to do non-synchronous collaboration. But then for the experts, we recruited them from Upwork. So we're able to do um, synchronous collaboration. And we find that um, the individual performance of non-experts is 45%. And when they collaborate, they, it improves the performance to 51%. Individual performance for experts is 56%. And when they collaborate, it increases the performance to 69%. And these are all averages. And we can see that see the um, significant scores uh, below. 
showing that there that this improvement is statistically significant. And um, the thirty three percent is the baseline performance because the task is um, um, given three a three paragraph article. Can you determine which one is um, AI generated? Because we had three paragraphs and we we randomly selected one to be AI generated. We also asked ChatGPT to do this task and it only achieved 38%. But I should say that I did not do uh, any clever prompt tuning. I just asked it, you are an expert, do this task. So finally, um, due to the birth of ChatGPT, there has been a lot of like um, detectors, including uh, commercial detectors. So people are like selling their platform for you to use for detection. And this is a, a table containing them. Uh, uh, this is GBT0. And the way this GBT0, GBT0 works is that it looks at perplexity and burstiness. So perplexity measures how unfamiliar a piece of text is for an LLM. So it means that if um, the text has high probability, it means that the text is um, uh, familiar. Oh, familiar. And then uh, burstiness uh, measures the sentence complexity. So finally, here's a table containing uh, some of the other ones I found and questions. Hmm. Right. I think some of our experiment has. I think that that's uh that's definitely a good point. Yeah. The, so the question is, um, uh, did we give humans the chance to say they can't tell? And I think that 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 was definitely like a a flaw in our study. And I, I found that out when I asked ChatGPT to do the task. And why the performance was so low is because. Sometimes ChatGPT would say, I don't know. And I would try and force it to make a decision. It's like, I just don't know. Or you'd say like, all the paragraphs are AI generated or none of them are, or two of them are. But then I told it, your only options are one paragraph. But it, it just, I just could not get it to choose one paragraph. And I realized that maybe we should have done that for the humans as well. Future work.
So, I mean, the simple example is the you know you probably have seen the news that some institution or uh, the faculty failed the entire class because ChatGPT says this essay was all uh, was written when you know it was not the case, right? So if we had a better tool to you know, explain, then that kind of a, uh, episode would have been uh, prevented. Uh, but you know, in, in more serious applications, I don't know, in the, some military setting, uh, imagine that you are getting the command through some kind of a text-based interface, and it's critical to understand whether this uh, command is from the uh, your human your supervisor or possibly be hijacked and by some, you know, the AI machine, right? So we can imagine. Uh, but really, it comes down to the preemptive uh, situation because since this is uh, the technique just happened, uh, I, I think it's not very clear how adversaries can possibly use this one. But we are hoping that preemptively think about the potential vulnerabilities and scenarios, and hopefully we can raise the awareness and then better prepare. Right? Uh, I hope that we don't see many real scenarios soon by doing this kind of active research. But you know, you never know. I mean, the, the advers adversaries also. I'm sure they're working hard to see how they can take advantage of this technology for for new applications. Okay, so that's the second part, and we will have a break, and then we will move on to the third part, which is the obfuscation. Thank you. So, so we will resume at the three thirty. Thank you. Is it three thirty? Hello, hello, everyone. Um, we will continue our um, workshop. So then, we have been through introductions, um, and when we have talked about how we can, how this uh, technology can help us generate um, deep defect, defect text, and other modalities. And we talk about detections, how we can effectively detect um, these artifacts as well. And what's come next, uh, we're going to talk about off off obfuscations. So obfuscation is a second task of defect text. So in obfuscation, we ask a very fun fundamental, fundamental questions. Can we make a defect text undetectable? The motivation is, um, again, can we make a defect text undetectable or in another words, can we conceal the authorship of a defect text by masking small changes to the text while reserving semantics? So intuitively, given a text gener gener generated by AI or ChatGPTs, can we go to the text and we modify just a little bit, just enough, just that um, these detectors, they cannot able to detect it anymore. And we need to make sure that the semantic reservations the contents, what the message behind the text is still maintained. So before we go into that, let's ask a philosophical, philosophical questions, the ship of uh, thesis. So the reason why we want to ask, uh, ask this question is, is um, like what, what, what make up an authorship behind a text, right? So on the, on the slide, you can see our pictures. On the left side, so we ask the questions, if you replace every part of a ship one by one until none of the original parts remain, will it be the same ship? And if not, at what point it becomes another ship? So when we ask this question, what we assume behind a text is a text has a lot of components. It has the message, it has a style, it has the rising style, it has the contents, it has the sources, it has the, um, any other components. And when we modify these texts, we replace one by one. And at which point we say, OK, this is enough. When should I stop? When should I stop in such a way that the detection models will not be able to detect the true authorship behind the text anymore? So in defect obfuscations, we want to formulate this obfuscation task as a relaxation of the shape of thesis because there's no formal or there's no comprehensive definition of when the authorship changes. So what we want to do is we want to rely on the detectors as a ground truth. So what we do is we go to the text, we change it a little bit one by one 
until the detection model say the, de the authorship already changed. So from detection, from detection to obfuscations, let's come back to the examples that we mentioned earlier. So this is the news articles um, gen generated by machines. So the prompt is by human, and we put the prompt into ZBT2, uh, last language models, and we ask to generate the contents of the articles. And the motivation pictures or the banner pictures of the articles is also generated by a machine learning model called Midjourneys. And given these whole articles, we put into the, the, the detectors. And of course, the detectors are going to say this article is generated or curated by AI. Now, when we talk about obfuscation, what do we mean? We want to make minimal changes to conceal the authorship and reserving the semantics. So let's say in the prompt, instead of say DC, we can change DC to Washington DC. In the articles, instead of saying water pouring through, through entrance, we can say water flooding to the entrance. And at the end, instead of saying in their case, we can say in the last 20 years, for example. And when we do this, the purpose is given the news per tube text, the machine learning model or detection models will not be able to say this is machine. And it actually answers this is human. So there's a lot of obfuscation te techniques in the existing literatures. Similar with the detections, we can um, formulate the authorship obfuscation for neural text or for machine generated text into two main groups. The first group is the stylometric obfuscations, and the second group is statistical ob obfuscations. Under the stylometric obfuscation, we have different types. The first one is lexical. Lexical deals with work choice. So for example, in the examples, we have a sentence, I got 99 problems, but you want be one. So when we say lexical obfuscation means instead of using the word God, we can replace with the word have. Instead of using the word problems, we can replace with difficulties. The next component in the stylometric obfuscations is syntactic. Syntactic dealing uh, deals with word orders. So for example, instead of saying I got 99 problems, we can say I have issues, 99 to be exact. The third type is morphological. Morphological deals with the word forms. For example, instead of saying 99 as a numbers, we can say 99, we can spell out. Instead of saying wants, we can say will not. So these dealing with uh, work from. The last time on the silo metrics is orthographic. Orthographic deals with punctuation. So sometimes maybe we can change the last um, dot um, to double exclamations, or we change the comma to another symbols, or even we can remove these punctuations from, from the text. Now we have talking about, we have, we was, We've been talking about the taxonomy of obfuscation, different techniques we can use. But how about the mechanisms? How, how we actually do, do so? So the mechanism here are the scenarios on which obfuscation is done. And in securities, we often call a threat more model. And these scenarios or detect models are very important. On the left side to the right side, the first one, we call it indirect obfuscations. In the indirect obfuscation models, we have the obfuscators as a blue, uh, blue rec rectangles. So the target model is the detection model F that we want to fool or we want to manipulate. So given the input text, and this text is written by machines. And when we input the text into the target model F or the detection model F, the model F is very good and is able to detect the input text is a defect text. Now the job of the obfuscator is it's going to change the text, uh, perturb the text in such a way that the target model F in the buttons will instead predict the obfuscation text as human and not machines. So in the indirect of, of, obfuscations, as you can see, the obfuscator doesn't communicate with the target models. It in, in, independently obfuscates the text on its own. Let's move to the second scenarios. In the second scenarios, one single change from the first scenario is that the obfuscator now can communicate 
or query the target model F. This scenario is more um, practical because a lot of deep uh, detection models nowadays has a API, public API. So now the obfuscators or the malicious actors can query the API and guide the virtual patients on the manipulation process to maximize the chances the target model F gonna be fooled. And we call these scenarios as direct off obfuscations. And in the direct obfuscations, we have one target adversaries or target model in mind that we want to fool. In the last scenarios, the one difference, is, the one difference uh, from the second scenario is that instead of using, instead of directly querying the target model F, which is not always available. For example, if Facebook or uh, Microsoft or Google, they have their own um, secret software or their own proprietary uh, machine learning, machine detect the, the detection models. The obfuscator in this case will not have access to those models. However, what they can do is they can train their own surrogate model G and they can query the surrogate model G to fine tune or to guide the obfuscation process. Now, what we hope is the guidance from the surrogate model G gonna be helpful to for a target model F that is unknown. In this case, we call it transferable ob obfuscations. And the goal is we want to transfer our obfuscation text to be able to fool a lot of uh, detection models. Now I will go uh, into details of um, a few existing work. The first one is stylometric ob obfuscations. Current techniques tend to focus on one or only a few linguistic features to obfuscate. For example, lexical, syntacticals. On the tables, you can see a list of techniques and an examples of the obfuscated examples. Let's go to the first ones. We have um, the third one, we have misspelling of text. This attack is very popular and intuitive. For example, from the original word acceptables, the attacker can change the A, the character A to I, and it's gone, and uh, they will be able to fool the detection more, more model. If you go to the last two, uh, we have uh, Milton X Adventures and Allison's. This op obfuscations model is more so sophisticated because not they earn, not only they change just one characters, but they change phrases and words at, at, at the same time. Um, that's a good question. We don't have any experiments to find it out. Um, so I cannot really answer. But I think in this case, um, the, yeah. And especially um, in this case, for example, if we can query the target model or the surrogate model, we can find out which phrases or which word we should put to. So I think that is also a more important, uh, um, uh, important com component as well. So for example, given a sentence, we say, okay, maybe the detection models is focused on this specific phrase. Then we can just go in there and put to that specific word. So in a sense, we want to optimize our tech as well. Yeah. Under the silo metric obfuscations, um, we can learn a lot of, uh, from the PAN communities. Um, in PAN communities 2016, they apply text transformations. For example, remove stop words, inserting punctuations, lowercase, uppercase. Uh, the goal is to push the statistics close metrics of each sentence closer to those of the corpus average. So here they use a lot of statistics uh, for numbers, for example, the average number of words, punctuations, the number of work tokens, number of stop words, etc. The next technique they um, use is they use sentence simplif simplification. So for example, from a sentence, basically my job involves com computer skills. So here they can simplify the sentence by removing the word, basically. 
and come up with a sentence, my job involves computer skills. And this, this, this techniques, although very simple, it reserves the semantic meanings. And this also can be applicable for um, authorship obfuscation as well. The last technique, technique is interesting. Um, we call it back trans translation. So back translation means from the original, uh, original language, for example, English, we can first translate the text into other languages, for example, German and French, and then we translate back to the English. So if you can imagine, this is similar to paragraph para phrasing the original text. And this technique also can help us preserve the original meanings and can be used as an obfuscation technique as well. The next is um, an existing work called Milton X. So what Milton X does for, to obfuscate is, it replaces words with neighboring words via semantic specific word embeddings. Basically, it's, it replaces words by words with uh, their syn syn synonyms. And these algorithms specifically use genetic algorithms. Basically, it's per tube um, choosing a different set of on alternative until the detection authorship changes and the text still reserves the semantic meaning. On the left side in the examples from the original sentence, first is identify the two important words to per tube. That is smart and message. With the word smart, it has three replacement candidates, wise, screw, and intelligence. And it chooses the word wise. And for the word message, it has four alternatives, note, memo, letter, bulletin, and document. And it chooses the word letter. And this selection process is done automatically done through the genetic algorithm. In this algorithm, Milton X, um, what it does is it uses direct ob obfuscations. What it means is Milton X interact or query the target models it wants to attack over time so that it can optimize um, its perturbations. Now, if we look at Milton X, one disadvantage of Milton X is it only can target one specific detection model. But in real life, sometimes the attackers or the ma malicious people, they want to perturb the text such that many detectors cannot be able to, to detect the original authorships. So these were adventures, they will pose an improvement. Adventures obfuscates aim to come up with obfuscations that are transferable to unknown advers adversaries. So what it does is it uses a surrogate, surrogate more model, and to design these surrogate models, adventures use ensemble models. So instead of just query one model, it query a lot of models at the same time to maximize the potentials that the obfuscation is going to be able to fool an unknown detection model in the future. And they assume the same set of training features between obfuscator and, and detectors. So you can see on the diagram on the left, the obfuscator first query the surrogate model G many, many times to fine tune the obfuscation text. And this obfuscation text is able to fool two out of the three target detection models. These techniques also help improve transferability. As you can see, if we test with four different detection models, for example, random for forest, RFC, SVM, and MLP, if we use just one single non ensemble models, for example, RFC and SVM as a sur surrogate model, we're not able to improve the transferability. However, if we use ensemble, ensemble approach for the surrogate models, the average attack success rate across these um, unknown detection models is, becomes much higher, higher. The next technique is called DFT Fuller's. This technique is very smart because it doesn't require any query to any detection models. What it does is it's used in direct obfuscations. It requires no query to detectors and no surrogate models. To do that, the FT fullers utilize a pre-trained language models. It substitutes a subset of most confidently predicted words, for example, in the color green and yellow, with lower confidence synonyms in red and purple. Basically, what it does is is look at the machine generated text and it see which word is the machine very confident 
when it generates. If the machine is very confident in generating a specific word or sentences, that word is, or sentences um, has, a, has a likelihood that it contains the marker of the last language models. So we, if we can simply switch these words to its their synonyms, we can um, fool this detection model. The other technique, which is more sophisticated, so sophisticated uh, introduced in 2022. And this paper introduced two options. The first option is straightforward. If we can train an internal defect detectors, then we can just generate a lot of text and choose the one that is the least likely to be detected as machine generated. The option two is to use an internal detectors as additional signal to guide the beam search to generate more human like text. So when JCBTs and this language model it generate text, sometimes they use a technique called beam search. So what it does is from the from the first word, for example, the token the, it gonna look into the, the future and say what is the most likely next token. For example, the most likely next token in this case is red. Be, in is either red or cat. And then because we have the score, um, and then it's, it's gonna go through, through, through the B, B, beam shot. So when we choose the next token, what we can do is we can adjust this score a little bit to make sure that this score is not too extreme. Because if the score is too extreme, we, uh, it's more likely that the text is gonna be very similar to, to other machine generated text. Another technique that they propose is we can just simply change the decoding strategies. So when we use this model, is uh, for example, JetZBTs and other open source language models, when we generate, we have a few param parameters to set. And one popular parameter, and if you're familiar with JetZBTs, is the temperatures. So if we say the temperature is very high, that means we don't want the generation to be diverse. But if we set the temperature to be very low, we want the generation to be diverse or more creative. And what they find out is, if we misalignment of the uh, decoding strategies between the detectors and the generators, led to a lower detection performance. So one straightforward way is, if we have a detectors that doesn't conform to the temperatures or to other parameters used by the Generate the unit to generate a text, the detection accuracy is going to drop a lot. So, as you can see on the tables, many de detectors witness uh, 13 to 97 degradations in recall of machine gen generated text. Another um, technique that we can use is we can let le leverage other work from adversarial tech literatures. Adversarial te text literatures is an NLP subfield where we want to fool uh, any machine learning models to output uh, target predictions or to fool theirs to output uh, incorrect predictions. So we can apply these literatures in our task. Let's say we have an original text as you don't have to know about music to appreciate the film's easygoing blend of comedy and romance. And here we show the examples of obfuscated text generated by three techniques. Text fuller, deep work book, and perturbation in the Y. If you look at the text fuller, what it does is it's used to replace a few words with syn syn synonyms. And if you look at the deep work book, it's um, target on the character level per perturbations. So sometimes it can uh, switch the characters, it can delete uh, characters. In the last method, perturbations in the Y, it focuses on the sound. For example, given the word appreciate, it changed the C characters to the S characters. And as a human, when we read or we speak appreciations, we still, the sound still the same. And this can also a techniques that help us reserve the semantic meanings while uh, fooling the detection model. And other more intuitive techniques, for example, paraphrase. So these examples, we, um, we have a machine generated text on the top. And this machine generated text was uh, correctly identified by an API called ZBT zeros. So you can see the API outputs, your text may include parts written by AI. And we give the text to a human. 
And then this is how the human paraphrase. In such a case that the, the such human can hide or conceal the machine authorship. And you can see after the human paraphrase the text, the API GPT-0 says, your text is likely to be written entirely by a human. And you can see uh, the highlight co com components among the two texts show us that just from one single data point, human tends to perturb a lot. Human tends to paraphrase a lot. How about ma machines? Recently, there's a technique called Deeper. And what this technique does is they obfuscate, it obfuscates via paraphrasing. But it's very smart. It fine tune an open source language model to paraphrase and remove machine learning specific markers, including watermarks. And you can see uh, the results on the left side are one examples. It doesn't paraphrase a lot, but it's paraphrased selectively. And on the right side, you can see one of the results fell in the papers. And let's focus on the last rows. The last row is text generated by GPT 3.5 or the versions currently used by ChatGPT. So if we use two detection models, detector GPTs and OI, OpenAI detection models, the detection accuracy is 67 and 45%. But when we use this technique deeper to paraphrase the text, the detection model dropped to only 14 and 38%. Now, as we go through both detection and obfuscations, this is quite intuitive to say that this is a cat and mouse game. And that these detection models, they become better, and the malicious actors or the other components, they will trying to come up with a better way to obfuscate the text to invade these detection models. There's a framework called Alphox, and there's um, motivation is simple, how, they, how we can use obfuscation to improve the detections. So the task is uh, on, depicted on, on the left side. So for the detectors, what we do is we can ask, please classify whether the text is generated by human or a, lang or, or a lang language model. So given a text, the detector say this text is written by human, this text is written by language models, or this text is written by human and language model editors. And then after that, we can input a target essays and we ask, we ask the detector to say, okay, given this target essays, what is your answers? And now what they propose is given the answers from the detectors, we can fit the answers to the at attackers. And the attackers gonna give, use these answers to fine tune the obfuscation technique over time. And you can see this is an iterative technique where we can generate better labels, AI or human, and use this label to better obfuscate text. And one key point in this technique is both the detector and the attackers, they can consider each other outputs. And when sharing this other output, they can improve the detection model significantly. In conclusion, the task def defect obfuscations comprise two main components, computer science and linguistics. In terms of computer science, of course we care about the performance, we care about the accuracies, but also we care about the speed, how efficient these techniques are. And we also care about the transferabilities, whether our techniques can be transferable to other detection models or to other real life scenarios. In terms of linguistics, um, we care more about the right of profiling, the writing structures, the language stru stru structures, for example, the silo metric of, of the text. And this combination of CS and lingu linguistics field is very important and crucial to improve the defect obfuscation task. Right. Thank you, Tai. So let me conclude. Um, so if you think about this field is really, um, the skewed playground is such that, you know, the attacker side, when they try to generate the defects, they pay little cost, but the us defending side, we, our effort and times are, you know, the orders of magnitude are larger. And this is the, the what this is uh, principle is saying, asymmetry principle. And then it's been, uh, you know, mentioned many times, uh, the, the reason it, uh, in the nature, uh, it was mentioned. Um, and you know, when you think about it, the defects, the technology is a serious problem, but 
the you know, paradigm shift is probably more concerning because a decade ago, right, when two politicians are arguing, you know, I did that or I did not do that. Uh, and at the end, if you show the evidence saying that, you know, news article says so, or this video proves you did this, then, you know, both parties sort of agree, right? But now, you know, no matter what the truth is, you can always say it could be defake, right? So, so the, you know, seeing is no longer the evidence, right? The, the documentation is no longer the evidence. Um, and this leads to the phenomenon called the reality of party, right? If the people feel that it's a very, very time consuming and effort are consuming to uh, discern what is true and what is not, then they simply give up and then they tend to, to resort back to their uh, prejudice, right? Which is a, a serious concern. And another uh, phenomenon is called the implied truth effect. If you recall a few years ago, when fake news was very, uh, you know, the uh, galore in the Facebook and Twitter, Facebook did this, uh, this experiment, right? They, whenever did they have a concerning uh, post, they pop up the warning message saying that, you know, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the speculation or you know, the concerning content. So click only if uh, you are sure. It's something like that effect, right? And then they measure how effective that uh, the warning message you, uh, was, right? At the end, what they found out is quite interesting, uh, which is people, you know, they found a certain uh, effect for the warning message, but they found out that people start to think that, oh, now fake news has this warning message, right? So that means that any uh, Facebook post without this warning message must be true. And then they you know, tended to share more information. And that is not true, right? The, the, we are able to find the you know, fake news only the uh, matter of the fraction, uh, the circulating around. So there are a lot of the fake news undetected, and people now believe that anything without warning message must be true, which is not the uh, effect that we uh, wanted. So the, there are uh, very complicated uh, issues here. So for the matter of the defect, especially defect tax, there are uh, very active research is going on. But we also have uh, many, many open problems and challenges. Uh, you know, a few are, are written here for detection side, for instance, uh, we only focus on the how accurate the detections are, but more importantly, you know, can we convince the uh, users? Can we convince the client with the, uh, the evidence and the explanation, right? Uh, that's probably more important. Uh, we only talk about the case, very simple case where given text is entirely written by one author, right? But, you know, uh, in, 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 in the recent application where humans are, machines are collaborating more, it's, you know, plausible that multiple authors are modifying text together and the part of the uh, multiple author can be human, the other part of, can be uh, machines, right? Or in other applications, uh, given the text, we have a mixture of the, uh, the authors or this the modification that uh, is done in sort of iterative uh, fashion, right? The, the obfuscation is not done once, but in multiple iteration and becoming more and more uh, challenging. So, so the more research are needed, definitely. So as any security problems, uh, uh, we have here uh, quite com convoluted situations. This is sort of the cat and mouse situation among three uh, actors here generators, obfuscators, and detectors, uh, or, or you know, the, uh, trying to out uh, the pace of the other. And we have it here watermark that complicate the situation. And uh, we have to be really mindful that whatever advanced AI and defect techniques are available to us, is also equally available to the uh, attacker side. So, uh, you know, we have to be very careful. Okay. Uh, and then finally, we are, are scheduled to present the extended version of this uh, tutorial next year uh, for the one of the NLP conferences. So uh, we just use this opportunity to, to advertise. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, we can answer. Yes. Yes, so, right. Yeah, we will send it to the uh, organizer, but also you can use to uh, this QR code or URL to download our uh, slide.
uh, in a sense, yes. I think the 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 pen community, the research community, has been studying that issue for for many many years. Uh, they generate the human written uh, documents and then invite the researcher to develop the models. They can, you know, they pinpoint who wrote it, right? So that's been going on for for decades. But now it becomes more complicated because now not only the human authors, machine authors can write it, right? And sometimes they can write together. So this, you know, complicates the, the situation entirely and, and we do not have a good solution addressing human as well as machine also at this point. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've been thinking about it. Uh, right now, in our controlled lab environment, our best accuracy is around the 93%, 93, right? But that is only for the limited data that we have. So I'm not entirely sure how it will perform when it is deployed to the unknown, you know, unseen tech, probably much lower, right? But in general, for, for any security problems, right, uh, it's not easy to... Uh, have up the you know near perfect solution for all kinds. I think what is more important is have a good deployable solution that can address like eighty percent of the easy problems, and then for remaining twenty percent is really really difficult, and you need a more sophisticated customized solutions. Right. So here, you know, if your applications uh, says, all right, I need a, a you know the good uh, accurate detector, that is a focus on ChatGPT alone, right? only for politics genre or entertainment genre. I think we can deliver that, right? But if you ask, do you have a really general purpose, near perfect solution, then I'm not sure if we can ever deliver. Yes. You want to answer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think obfuscations will take more computations. The reason why is during obfuscation, you need often need to query the model multiple times. And if you have a very long document, that means you need to query a much more than a number of tokens to make sure you have a good com combinations. Um, but, but at the same time, as the model, this model become more complex, the generation can will take more time as well. So I think it's gonna be um, a, a, an in, in interesting game in the future. Okay, so with that, it's a bit early, but uh, let's conclude here. Thank you very much.